Hello, my name is Nancy, and the research I'm doing is on psychosocial effects on children during and after cancer. Uh, this is a very broad subject, which I realized once I started doing all the research. Uh, but the reason I decided to do this was uh, I took care of a girl not too long ago, and she had a brain tumor. And she was up on the floors, and she came several times down to our ICU because all of a sudden she would just not respond anymore. And, um, you know, I was, I was with her and I was with the neurosurgeon and she tried to do all these different things at the bedside. And she was, she finally made, said a comment that made me think about things. And she said, you know, anatomically there's, I, you know, I can't find anything wrong with her. You know, her CT scans look fine. Her MRI looks fine. Um, you know, she just hasn't been herself since she got diagnosed it's almost like she just doesn't have the will to live anymore. Um, and so that's kind of what got me thinking if like her depression and just like how she was feeling, you know, would really affect her, um, her outcome. There we go. Um, so to just give you a little bit of background on on ch uh, childhood cancers. Uh, there's about 8,400 children under 15 who are diagnosed with cancer yearly. 31.4% um, of those are leukemia, 17.6% are CNS tumors, um, and 12.4% 12, 12 are lymphomas. Um, the rest consists of very minor percentages um, of all the other cancers that can you know, potentially um, occur in children. 65% of those children will survive. Um, and it's been proven, the research is out there, uh, that children you know, who do get treated for cancer will have um, some sort of deficits. Um, to add some more on, on this background here, some other research that I was also reading, um, I think that 8,400 with a 65% survival rate was about like one in like 260 or 300 um, or so grown-ups um, would have been a survivor of childhood cancer. Um, research now shows, this was written in 2000, so maybe like 2008 or somewhere, that now it's closer to about one in 600 um, adults would have survived um, some sort of childhood cancer. However, based on those numbers, they were doing 18-year-old um, and younger. Um, and then unfortunately, reaching that 15 to 18-year-old um, age, there's a lot of cancers that are also just only specific to early adulthood, late teen, teen age. Um, so I felt like for that purpose of just discussing childhood cancers, I would kind of stick with with uh, with this one here and not particularly the other one. But it is increasing and everyone is surviving and I just thought I'd mention that as well. So some of the deficits that were uh, found through the research, um, I kind of broke them down into, into three different sections. And so the first one is neurocognitive, um, and it includes things like spatial disturbances, dyslexia, and writing disabilities, and as well as a decreased IQ. Um, a lot of these just have to do with, with, with the chemo and radiation, depending on where they, had, where they got the radiation. Um, and definitely writing disabilities, I didn't also include in here, but um, something like learning disabilities as well, and just the more difficulty in school. Um, although the difficulty in school kind of also tied in with um, the social and the behavioral competence because uh, they just are they just overall have trouble in school. They either get teased or they miss a lot of school. So um, school and learning kind of goes into all of them. Um, but a lot of studies did show that the younger the children were, the, the less neurocognitive I just couldn't fit all of it on the screen. Uh, the younger the children, the less neurocognitive deficits they had. So if they were a childhood survivor um, at age four or five, um, pretty much they could continue on the rest of their education being where they need to be, or even you know honor students and stuff like that. Whereas if they were uh, diagnosed and treated at the age of you know 12 or 13, then they had a little bit more difficulty um, with school after that. Um, behavioral competence, 
um, withdrawal, aggression, anxiety, and depression. Um, so, I mean, you know, children have cancer and, and they're going to feel bad and, and of course they're going to get depressed and they're going to get anxious. Um, one of the things, oddly enough, um, I did have an article that talked about post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I, I really did think just based on the title and reading that article that it was going to tell me that children do exhibit post-traumatic stress syndrome from cancer. Um, and oddly enough, the, the studies um, or the results on that study showed that they didn't. Um, and they, they gave a couple of different uh, suggestions as to why they, you know, their numbers proved them wrong. And, um, and one of the things was that maybe cancer and the treatment of cancer and their hospitalizations and all that aren't as bad as we think they are and that they actually don't become traumatized from them. Um, even though us as adults would think that something like that for a child would be extremely um, traumatizing. Um, however, they do show signs back to my slide on withdrawal, aggression, anxiety, and of course, depression. Um, one of the downsides to these things, something like an anxiety disorder um, or depression, um, which can all be diagnosed clinically and treated clinically. Um, unfortunately, there is no uh, criteria for children to get diagnosed with these um, with these disorders. Um, so that's where actually probably most of the articles that I read did mention that, that they can just go based on what, what they would uh, use as their own kind of pediatric criteria as to just kind of being isolated or, or stuff like that, but not necessarily clinically to be able to, to prove that they did. Um, and the other one that I that I uh, am going to talk about is also social competence. Um, so a lot of these children that are either currently going, going through, through some sort of treatment or have had it in the past um, have reported to have less friends and they prefer to spend time alone. Um, they also show a delay in psycho, so psychosexual development. Um, there was an extensive study done and they had um, a lot of them the control group was their siblings or their cousins. And it did show that uh, that compared to that control group, they did have, you know, way in the long run, clearly, um, they did have uh, decreased percentages of long-term relationships um, as well as marriage. Um, when it came to parenthood, um, a lot of them definitely had less children. Um, and the, the actually the females did show a greater a uh, greater percentage of wanting children, their desire for children, um, than the non-cancer group. Um, and which is funny because, like, as I mentioned here, that males have a higher fertility rate um, after treatment. Um, and if they did by any chance, you know, uh, did get married or, or did uh, engage in a long-term relationship or did have children, um, it was way later in life um, compared to the non-cancer group. Um, another, another subject that I, I didn't uh, throw on here, but um, a lot of these things can get affected because uh, one of the things that I did read is that most of these children, maybe now older teenagers or now adults, um, still live with their parents uh, and it's at a highest, at a higher percentage than the, the normal, the normal person um, and more so uh, men versus women. Um, so that can definitely impact any one of these, uh, any one of these reasons as far as, you know, relationships and marriage and children. Um, I didn't go as far as to figuring out why they still live with their parents, um, you know, whether it's a comfort thing, a financial thing, uh, you know, who knows. Um, I did a little bit more specific uh, research specifically to brain tumors, like I said, mainly because of um, the little girl I talked about in the beginning. Um, so a couple of things that I did find out particular to brain tumors um, is that the brain tumor survivors um, didn't show much difference in the outcome from all the other things I just mentioned. Um, so they definitely exhibit all those other things that I mentioned regarding uh, behaviors and um, all the neurocognitive aspects. Um, that didn't change much at all just for those patients with specifically uh, brain tumors in the past. Um, 
although they did mention that there is definitely other factors that play important roles in the lack of, of development, whether it's social development, behavioral development, um, definitely the age of diagnosis, uh, the site of the tumor, whether or not they required neurosurgery, um, infections they may have had, or increased intracranial pressure um, and radiation. Uh, this, they were thinking it was more of an anatomical issue, not so much um, just a psychology issue. Um, you know, did they go in and remove the whole frontal lobe, you know? Um, and definitely the younger patients uh, seem less impaired than the older patients. Um, and, it, and it didn't give too many specifics as to, as to why, but I, um, it kind of lured towards a sense that even if they did require neurosurgery or they did have episodes of intracranial, of increased intracranial pressure, um, just, you know, the younger they are and uh, at the time, then just as they get older, they just learn to, whether through therapies or, or just their own cells and their brain, just, uh, you know, learn to uh, to compensate and just make up for those differences. So um, these patients are also considered a high risk group um, just because out of this, out of this uh, study, this Martin's um, made with, with actually with different kind of diagnoses, um, brain tumor patients, uh, were the ones that reported the poorest health satisfaction. Um, and those were just complications or problems that were still related to their initial diagnoses. Um, they had lower self-esteem. Uh, they also engaged in less physical activity. Um, and they also had an increased level of psychosocial disorders. Um, as far as nursing and what can nursing do, uh, a, couple, a couple articles did kind of mention nursing a little bit. Um, and definitely that as a nurse, it's important to, to, to address and to realize that these deficits um, really truly affect them and that we need to address them in order to just promote a successful transition um, into adult life. You know, clearly they, you know, they're not gonna go through adulthood um, without being, or having the capability of, you know, having a boyfriend or girlfriend um, or being able to live outside their, their parents' home. Um, and that perhaps it's us as well, the nursing staff at the bedside, um, which is much make, must make those assessments and intervene when necessary. Um, I know as soon as, I mean, it, for, for me personally, it's hard in the ICU just because a lot of the times they're extremely sick and I, you know, half the time they're, they're, they're not responsive. Um, and or we have them sedated. Um, but I know when we do have one of those kids that maybe the parents are just like, you know, they're not the same, um, or, you know, they seem a little bit depressed, you know, Rosen always cheers them up and I put it on and, and she didn't even want to see it or, um, or something. We definitely get uh, child life, we get music therapy, pet therapy, art therapy um, involved. And if they're they're well enough to be able to leave the ICU for a second. We do encourage if we have the staff to, you know, be able to take them down, down to the to our garden and have them walk around, um, you know, with their parents or 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 have you know grandparents or um, some sort of other family just come and meet them and have a picnic at the garden or something, um, and also to focus on the daily functions, which may also be important to them. Um, you know, some of these articles focused a lot on, on IQ and on how they behaved with, with each other and whether they showed signs of, um, of you know, withdrawal and anxiety and, and depression. Um, but, you know, they don't necessarily need to have a, a high IQ to be able to do their day-to-day, -day, um, you know, ADL. So, and that's usually what's important for them, you know, if they can't get out of bed themselves or they can't brush their own teeth, I'm sure their their self-esteem and just their self-worth may, may drop. So realizing that, you know, that perhaps we just need to help them learn and, and you know, do the whole like repeat and, and they'll get better with time as far as, you know, brushing their teeth, combing their hair, um, bathing themselves, getting in and out of bed or chairs or, you know, learning to drink or, you know, whatever it is that they may need to do in order to to go home and feel like like they can fulfill their own needs. Um, it was also suggested in the research that uh, that perhaps children 
um, do need to undergo some sort of formal assessment prior to initiating treatment. Um, a couple, a handful of the articles actually did say that, uh, that unfortunately they didn't really know what the baseline of the child was prior to the treatment. Was it much of a change? Um, or was it just a little bit of a change? You know, were they extremely smart before they got diagnosed with leukemia? Um, and then now their IQ is half of that, or, you know, were they just, you know, not that high of an IQ to begin with? Um, so it was suggested that perhaps, you know, before the children start, um, start treatment, there should be some sort of formal, like I said, to, um, to have a baseline for them and then know, you know, in what areas they need to work with and in which areas they, they maintain the same. Um, and definitely to educate and prepare the parents. I mean, I, I work in, in pediatrics and, you know, and even I'm sure with those that work in adults, it's always like you want to teach, you teach and educate. Um, you know, we do too. I can't tell a four-year-old, hey, life is going to be hard. Um, but you can definitely educate and prepare the parents for those difficulties to come um, and encourage looking for, you know, for resources and, and definitely, you know, seeing what they have as far as uh, family support or community support um, and stuff like that. Um, so finally, just to review some of the results, like I said, I'm trying to keep it simple. I mean, there was a lot, but um, so definitely more children are surviving cancer. Um, it has been shown in some studies that negative emotional profiles, um, such as like depression, are associated with the worst survival. Um, and it's been proven that those children who have been treated with cancer will definitely have deficits. Um, but that of course there is a presence of a variety of factors which may influence outcomes. Um, and to touch up on this one, a lot of the, um, some of them, you know, gave their little disclosures as far as um, things that will influence their outcomes, but um, a lot of them did touch a little bit on the socioeconomical, uh, economical status of, of the family, um, the parental involvement, um, you know, how much, uh, how much, how much resources that these kids have. You know, did the parents go out of the way to try to get them PT and OT, um, you know, at home or, or, you know, get them to go, you know, um, have like site visits um, or were some of these parents just kind of like your cancer is done and treated and you're just going to go on and live your life as a child. Um, so that was definitely one of the factors that, uh, that I did read up on one of the, a couple of the articles. Um, and also, like I had said before, I think I mentioned um, most of these articles did say that there is no formal criteria for pediatrics. Um, so, you know, they can't technically get uh, get diagnosed. Therefore, I think, you know, it's hard to diagnose a six-year-old um, with depression and, and, you know, and have them uh, um, go see a psychiatrist and, you know, most definitely take medication and stuff, I think. Um, there's a big runaround um, when it'll come to that. So, um, so they can't really say, you know, oh, for the children that have an anxiety disorder, um, you know, this is a percentage of how many of them survived after so many years just because they can't make those, uh, uh, those uh, formal, uh, formal diagnoses, I guess. Um, and I think, uh, I think that is it. Um, here, yes, it is. Here are my references. Um, it was definitely interesting reading up on this. Uh, there is a lot more I could have shared, but it would have gone a lot more thorough and a lot more extensive and uh, a lot more confusing, unfortunately. But um, it's definitely a, a subject that still needs to be researched and, and has a lot of limitations at this point. Um, but something tells me a lot of these researches are you know, started coming out about 20, 15 years ago, and, and hopefully we'll see a lot more of what's being studied now um, in the upcoming years. Thanks.